uh, Dr. Gallo, uh, for those of you who, those watching who aren't familiar with your stuff, um, as you are relatively new to the kind of baseball scene, online at least, um, I think you know people would be interested in learning a little bit more about your background. Um, you know, how did you become the Flows Doc? Where did that name come from? And maybe some of like your credentials, like what is what are you doing outside of the social media stuff that you're putting out, and how did you get to this point? What do I start, man? I think I have an interesting story. I usually start with a uh, high school. You know, it's, it's one of those where I, I dropped out of high school and I luckily found myself getting drafted by the Dodgers. So I played five years of minor league baseball. Uh, then after that, I was, I was basically 25 out of baseball and basically out of options too, right? Where you're thinking, all right, I'm a high school dropout. Uh, what's my options now, right? It's like either go be a coach. And I really didn't want to go the coach route. You know, I wanted to be more just like a homebody. Uh, so I, I decided to go back to school, give it a shot, and then turns out I actually had a decent brain. And also another thing was it turns out that in those five years with the Dodgers, it changed my the, my entire person, uh, the person I was. You know, it showed me discipline. It showed me how do you accomplish something? How do you set goals? How do you just persevere through a full season? Uh, and then I was just able to apply a lot of those things I learned playing into the classroom. And after that, to be honest with you, it was not that hard. Once I got to the classroom level, it was actually um, it was one of those where you, you realize, like, you know what? I think what I just didn't have back in the day when I dropped out was discipline of just showing up every day, getting one percent better, putting my mind to it, just really being persistent. Uh, and that's kind of the mentality I developed when I was in, in pro ball. So I'm, I'm curious if you had like a kind of a mentor figure in in pro ball, because a lot of guys, especially high school signs or high school draft picks, um, you know, you typically see a little bit more immaturity from those guys, like having just having been around it as a, I was a college draft pick, uh, a senior sign. And you see these kids, these 18 year olds come out of high school, the high school draft, and they don't really have a lot of guidance. And unless somebody takes them under their wing, a lot of times they just kind of fizzle out. They start going to casino every day. They, you know, they're they're drinking, they're going out, they're partying and they they don't have that like discipline that you maybe sometimes get from a four year college. So I'm curious if you had somebody kind of take you under their wing, maybe it was older players, maybe it was a coach, or if you just had to learn that maturity and that, that structure from just seeing how the better players were going about their business. I think it was a combination because I felt like the Dodgers did a great job of just keeping the old school guys there. You know, I mean, when you have Tommy Lasorda walking around and all the history he brings and all the, the motivation and just the focus, and the speeches he has, and then you have Jaeger, you have all these old Dodgers, right? Mickey Hatcher was my first coach. I mean, you're just looking at it, you're just looking at Or Horsheiser, you're looking at Dodger history all the time. And it's one of those where it's just the culture of the Dodgers was, for me, a blessing because I was able to be around all that culture change of, hey, you can do anything in life, but this is the way you have to start thinking, right? Like, we're, we're gonna win, but we're also gonna be a family, we're gonna build a culture. And it wasn't just one person. I felt like everything just changed for me in the sense that I was just around people that loved the sport and also that they were not afraid to share like their thoughts and share their, their failures too. Uh, and I feel like for me, that was the biggest game changer is just, I went from a culture of where there's no one dreaming, where there's everybody just kind of going after each other. And, and, and then I went from a culture from that to now in pro ball where the Dodgers was just, and for me, it was a blessing and it was, it wasn't, I can't pinpoint one person, but I could pinpoint several coaches that I felt like just shared a lot of their knowledge and a lot of the things they felt at outside of baseball where, where it changed the way I was thinking about everything, man. So how, how did your playing experience then influence you getting into, you know, the physical therapy side of things? Did, did you have, you know, maybe trainers or PTs in pro ball where they kind of like pushed you or nudged you or you, you looked up to them where you're like, hey, after I play, after I'm done playing, like, I really want to do what they're doing or get into this side of it. Was it something on that end or was it like your career is over and you have to kind of self-reflect, like, what am I going to do next? And then decide, for, you know, to get into the PT side. What, what was the kind of turning point for you either during, the, you know, towards the end of your playing career or after you were done playing that made you think, okay, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life? Well, the cool thing was even, you know, some people come into your life and you don't realize they're there for a reason. And when I was with the Dodgers, the physical therapist that was there, uh, Brian Shear, actually knew one of my classmates from high school because he became a physical therapist. And it was kind of like a triangle where Brian's like, hey, I know Brandon. And when you're playing, you're kind of just in your own zone. You don't think about like, hey, maybe this is going to be my future or whatever it is, right? But for some reason, I did talk to that person a lot, quite a bit when I was playing. 
not through injuries, just kind of running into him. And he's like, hey, how's this doing? This and that. And I was like, oh, he's a PT. So that was like the first time I was introduced to physical therapy and actually knew a person that was doing that profession. Uh, so then once I got out and I was done playing, then I started to think about, all right, what's an option for me? And first I thought PE teacher, but then I just realized that, I mean, I didn't do too well in high school. So I was like, I don't know if I want to go back to that environment and, and go that route again. And then also dealing with um, just the issues you deal with as a teacher, right? Where I was like, I don't know if that's my route. Uh, and then that's when I started thinking about maybe physical therapy might be, it wasn't that clean though. Cause it, it was one of those where it, when you go to college, a lot of the times you don't get guidance there either, you know, where you're just kind of searching around, taking classes. Uh, and then, but at that point, I think Brian, when I met him, I was able to kind of go like, Hey, you know what? PT sounds like a viable route. Gotcha. So when, once you kind of, you, you're studying PT in school, I'm curious, like, what, what are some of the other influences that led you down this path where you are kind of known for now as far as, like, all the movement flow type stuff? Um, I see some similarities with DNS. Uh, I see some maybe similarities with some of the ecological dynamics type stuff. Um, is this stuff that you were taught in PT school? Because, this, you know, it's a little bit unconventional compared to what I've, you know, seen a lot of PTs come out of school having learned. Um, what were some of the maybe influences or mentors or schools of thought or internships or something like that that you did? that got you down this rabbit hole? I'll tell you this. I think I stumbled on it on accident, I'll be honest with you, because in PT school, we follow the, we follow the medical model. So as you know, the medical model is very orthopedic driven. So we're looking at joints, we're looking at joints by themselves, isolated, we're looking at range of motion. We're looking at all the stuff that like a typical PT would do. Uh, as far as mortar learning, we're not really at that point. I mean, I graduated in 2010. So like dynamic systems theory, ecological approach, all those were non-existent back then as far as our schooling. Uh, so it's one of those that maybe about five years ago, I started just listening to like Rob Gray, what he had to say. And for some reason, I mean, I've always seen movement as a baseball player first, right? So I've always seen it as like, all right, how did I learn how to play? How did I, how did I figure this out, right? How did, did I, I didn't have much coaching growing up. Like what happened? How was I able to self-organize myself into like this, elite mover. And I felt like when I started listening to Rob Gray and the ecological approach, I started to go like, hey, you know what? This makes sense. This makes sense. Just common sense that this is a way that we could learn to move. And this is a way that we could actually, some theories that, that I started to hear that I said, this makes a lot of sense. And then I took the deepest dive into dynamic systems theory, just listening to podcasts, just watching how coaches were, were going about it. And for me, that's kind of how I stumbled onto the ecological approach. As far as DNS, I mean, I do work with a clinician that went all the way to Prague and, and kind of nerded out on DNS. But at the same time, when they brought it back, I was, I was asking her, like, hey, how do you use this with baseball players? And she's like, oh, you can't. You know, it's just different. It's like, you know, it's this and that. And I, she really couldn't answer, like, how do you put, bring this to the sport? Because, like I mentioned, I always see it from a baseball player first. And I go, like, dude, I'm not going to bring something where I feel like it's just not practical. And I want to make it real practical and simple for people to understand. And for there, for me, I felt like there was a gap in between like what DNS was doing and then also the baseball field. But then I started to learn the principles and I started to learn the developmental kinesiology and I started to take deeper dives into the patterns. And then I started looking at the ecological approach and I said, you know what? I don't know if there's anything more natural than your developmental patterns, you know? And I think sometimes, I mean, I don't know. I think we search as instructors, we want to have the answer, right? We, we want to go like, hey, I figured it out. This is the pattern. Like, this is the hinge. The hinge is the pattern that everybody needs to learn. This is it. And sometimes it's not that easy. You know, we, we got to understand and, and kind of see, like, how did we learn to hinge, right? How did we learn those patterns? How does somebody self-organize their body and their nervous system to be able to do that pattern well? Long story, but that's basically, I mean, in a nutshell, that's exactly how it developed the flows. It was, it was looking at it from that angle. And then looking at it from the movement flow and the transitions and not training positions and really looking at that fluidity of how people move and then going like, you know what? No one's training it. At least they're not training it to the extent to where I'm training it, right? Where I just nerded out on it from every angle. So I'm curious where, where, well, first off, how you would define the flow. And then second off, where do some of these different progressions that you'll post uh, online fit into? Because, you know, you work with injured injured patients as well, but you also work with athletes who aren't injured, right? Like you're working, you're working through the whole spectrum. So how, how do you maybe implement, are there regressions like some of maybe the DNS 
more static or slower slower tempo things into these more full full form total body you know full speed flowing movements how do you progress them and then where might you put them you know in a program both from a rehab standpoint or from hey i'm just a healthy high school player who this stuff looks interesting and i'm interested in like how does how do i add this into my routine like where what piece do you put it in and then are you also using some of these more advanced progressions in a clinical setting yeah, well, I think the biggest thing is for me is when you, every time you regress something, you always have to understand that you're trying to simplify it, right? You're trying to simplify the whole. And for me, it's not about taking it apart and simplifying it that way. It's by how do we do like a movement simplification, simplification, right? How do we simplify the task that they're doing? So for me, it's always been start with the most dynamic ones and then work your way back into where now we're just doing one transition, but we're working from like a dead bug to a side plank. And then we're trying to ingrain that simple task of doing that in an environment where it's pretty, not that very complex, where they're able to really ingrain that pattern into them. Uh, and then also, I mean, if as a PT, if someone's injured, I also go back to what I learned in PT school. Like I always feel like there's people that, like they're learning a new theory and then they throw everything away. Like they go, oh, that was, I don't need to know that anymore. And for me, I always feel like every, every experience you've had and every technique you've learned has value is just how you use it. You know, so when someone comes to me and they're injured, then I do look at tissues. I do look at isolated joints. I do figure out, is there something we could do here that, but I always go back to the whole, right? I always integrate it right back into, all right, we're doing this, but we're also gonna train it this way. So would you say some of the, let's say it's, it's a healthy, healthy pitcher. They see some of these cool, like, uh, you know, 90, 90 flows, um, or different like, you know, backhand throwing drills where they start from a seated position, field a ball, get up, throw. Um, do you see that stuff as primarily fitting into like their warm up? Is that how you might program some of these different flows? Like, hey, get, you know, get to the field, do a dynamic, or do you use it as a dynamic warm up? Do you use that as their, like their skill work, like before catch play? How, do, how does it fit into like a day in the life of a high school athlete? The best ways I've seen our, our colleges implemented is they use it as a primer. So, so they use it before they hit, before they pitch, before they get into the bullpen, they'll do like five flows. Uh, it's always changing, so they'll do different ones based on, on where they're at in the progression. So it's one of those that that's probably the best way I've seen it. Another way I've seen professionals use it and also high school kids has been as recovery. So they've had a real tough workout. They've gone in the gym, they, they did a bunch of weights. And then at the end they go, okay, well, let me do some flows just to calibrate my movement, right? Because for me, the biggest thing is, is Whenever you do other movements or, or like load up your body, you're, you're gonna kind of corrupt the system a little bit. So it's always good to keep those movements in check and those patterns. I'm curious to get your take on generally how athleticism, first off, what your definition of athleticism is and then how, how is athleticism developed, right? In your case, when you were coming up, you know, you weren't necessarily doing like flows training formally, right? But you were, you were moving athletically, you were, I'm assuming, potentially playing multiple sports, like how does this athleticism develop? In your case, how did it develop? Um, and is this kind of like, is this system really based around building athleticism? Is that, is that kind of the purpose of the flow? Talk to me about that term athleticism and how it fits into the flows model. Well, for me, athleticism, if we just take it back down to like day zero when we're born, right? is the way we develop athleticism is by engaging with our environment, right? You want to do something, you want to do a task. And for me, it's, it's the kids that are just genetically predisposed that just have better movements in general are going to explore more. So for me, athleticism is built through movement exploration, right? And the kids that for whatever reason are not as coordinated when they're born, they're not going to explore as much. So what ends up happening is the kids that's climbing on the monkey bars and jumping off couches and jumping off the roof, that kid's going to be super athletic just because genetically they were already there or their environment, right? Like their parents are not hovering over them going like, oh, get down from there or don't jump. Uh, and I think that's exactly how we develop athleticism is by exploring our environment, by jumping, doing all these crazy things that we did as children. But I think also the opposite is, is if we don't have that environment, right? Kids that are not as coordinated, kids that came out and for whatever reason were missing a developmental pattern, those kids never explore. So by the time they get to 10, 11, 12, uh, my biggest thing is, okay, well, let's explore, right? Let's, we have neuroplasticity, so our brain is plastic. 
you can learn anything. I mean, I don't care how old you are. You can be 50. I've had 60 year olds that do flows that can get up from the ground now without using their hands. And they're looking at me going like, how does this happen? And I'm like, don't worry, your, your brain will figure it out. We just have to go through the process that we went through when we were kids. And we need to explore these patterns. And, and once we ingrain them back in you, like it's gonna show, uh, obviously that's how you, w one way to develop athleticism. The other one is through just exploration. And some kids, I just have it naturally, right? I mean, let's, let's be honest here. There's some people that are just natural freaks, but that's like 1% of the people we work with, right? I mean, 0.0% maybe. So I, I, I developed the flows for that other 99% uh, where we go like, let's do some movement exploration. Let's explore these patterns. And for me, what I found in the clinic was when we do that, they become more athletic. And not only athletic, they become, the athleticism plays on the field where all of a sudden they're making plays without even thinking about it, they're getting into those positions and actually transitioning and flowing uh, with the baseball versus before where they, that wasn't even an option. I'm interested in, in that idea of exploring um, because, you know, sometimes when you just see like excerpts of, you know, a, a coach or in your case, like a practitioner, some of their stuff, you know, I, I don't necessarily understand the, the thought process behind how you integrate the whole thing where you just see like the little 10 second snippet of a guy doing an exercise but it's really interesting to be able to pick their brain on okay how does this how is this integrated into everything else that they're doing um you know what's the thought process behind it so when you say ex explore like if you give somebody a certain movement are you encouraging them like this is the this is like the right way to do this movement or are you are you encouraging them to hey, we're going to try to like get up from the ground without using our hands. We're going to try to accomplish this task. And they're given some wiggle room in which to, in which to play in that movement. Or, or is it specifically like, hey, I want you to like keep this perfect form throughout. Right? How much of it is like allowing that creativity to shine through and allowing their body to navigate through different, different tasks and find different solutions with the environment? I think a lot of it is exactly what you said there is – they're going to be searching and discovering different solutions for the problem that we just present as the exercise. And it's one of those where I always give athletes the freedom and, and I always say on every video, stay athletic. I mean, that's probably, I say it a thousand times probably on the app because for me, that's, that's the number one thing, right? Is we don't want to prescribe something where we're robbing these athletes of their athleticism, just going like, Hey, guess what? Figure it out, stay athletic. But at the same time, I also feel that sometimes we do have to funnel the movement somehow. Right. But I think we do that by looking at bigger things like book, looking at how they like movement centration. Right. We're not looking at little joints and little things. We're looking at just the entire movement. Are you staying centered? Right. Are you working yourself back to neutral? Are you doing those things that are just just big, just like physics wise? Those are just big components that you need from movement. But it's on a macro level, not this like hey, make sure that your ankle bends 10 degrees and that your knees flex 45 degrees and that your hip internal rotation is it. No. It's one of those where we go like, we're looking at the entire movement and then we're going at, hey, guess what? We're gonna explore these different patterns. And the cool thing is, I mean, I've developed so many flows that, and the regressions and the progressions are on point that you go like, just get on the app, start exploring the baseball flows. And, and for me, that's when I've seen the biggest changes when athletes just go and start exploring. Uh, we also have athletes that are kind of like the older model, right? Where they're constantly asking for mechanical cues. And it requires a little bit of education, but for me, I'm more than willing at this point to say that we don't do things that are too mechanical in the, in the app. So you'll err, you'll err on the side of less coaching, less verbal feedback, um, so that they aren't overanalyzing, right? It's like, here's point A, here's point B, figure out how to connect the dots, figure out how to get from here, accomplish the task, and execute the movement, versus I need you to be at exactly this torso angle, feel this exact way, then this, then this, then this, then this. It's like, no, here's, here's the two points. I need you to accomplish this. And like how, how much, how much of it is like just demonstrating how much of it is verbal cueing, how much of it is just letting them like being very intentionally vague so that they can fill in the gaps themselves. I would say about 80, 90% is probably being intentionally vague. Just giving them a couple of cues that for me, I think in the clinic, you always see patterns on how people move and kind of like I always call them like uh, non-negotiables, right? Where you go like, hey, you might want to get make sure that you're staying centrated and make sure that when you're putting yourself in this in this somewhat position, right, where you're kind of transitioning in and out of it. But it's one of those where I do leave a lot of room. It's just two, three-minute videos of me mainly mainly doing the flow 
And then also educating them on what we're talking about now, right? Is that movement is not as linear as people think, you know, that there's exploration, there's figuring it out. There's a lot of figuring it out, but there's also a lot of figuring it out in a, in a progression, right? Where we're just not throwing it against the wall and hoping that they self-organize into whatever pattern. Uh, Cause I also see a lot of that out there where I, where I go like, you know what, just a challenge point for that athlete. It's way over their head. You know, it's one of those things where you're introducing now movements that are very inefficient and they might be getting from point A to point B, but are we, treat, are we teaching efficiency at that point or are we just teaching uh, movements that you go like, there's tons of compensatory patterns there. So I think that's where the app comes in, where the progressions I feel are crucial for building you in a, in a position where we're eliminating a lot of those inefficiencies. I think that's such a key point that, that people might, might have overlooked. It's, it's right, it's this idea of like, you're, you want to have a bandwidth in which to explore a movement, right? But if that movement is just way too advanced for the athlete, right, you want it, you're regressing them to a, to a version of that where they still have bandwidth to explore, but it's on a less advanced version of that. I just think that's a, that's a crucial point for people to pick up on. I definitely relate to this this idea of like self-organization can only be taken so far because I've seen examples of it where it's just like, hey, give a bunch of athletes, you know, a bunch of different like weighted balls and just like zero coaching, zero verbal, zero, like no coaching at all. They'll figure it out. And what you find is like they don't really figure it out. Like you do need a, the occasional, some, some will, some will, but a lot of them ultimately will have some major timing flaw or major thing that if they just try to figure it out, they'll get stuck at some point. Again, not excessive not excessive coaching, excessive feedback, because that creates a whole host of problems too. But if there's a major issue that's holding them back, just exploring isn't always, in, like there does need to be a balance between some degree of coaching while not over coaching. And so we've, we've very much seen the same exact thing, that it can't be totally hands off, um, but it also can't be saying something after every single repetition, because now that athlete starts to get over reliant on feedback and you start to create a whole host of, of other issues. So I, just, I appreciate what you're saying there. Um, I'm curious your take on, aside from the, the specific flows that they can do like as a team, you know, in a, maybe inside, like what are some flow-like things that they might be able to do in practice? So for example, like fielding ground balls. I'll have guys, some of my pitchers even, that maybe when they were in high school, they were infielders and they were two-way guys, and that was like part of where their patterns initially developed, their, you know, how their arm strength initially developed. And so I'll have them field ground balls for five minutes. Like, hey, feel some backhands, field, you know, field all different angles, make some hard throws, make some snap throws, um, and just use that to get them to feel a dynamic, get, to, get them to feel athletic. So like maybe that's one example where it's not, not quote unquote like a flow, but it's really still working on the athleticism piece of it. They're having to be very dynamic, very versatile. Um, they're dealing with a ton of variability, rep to rep, and it's fun, right? It's not like this robotic thing that they're being prescribed. It's like, go field ground balls, have fun for five minutes. Do you have other examples of taking like something, a flow to like the other side of the specificity continuum where it's like very, very specific to the sport. Whereas like some, you know, some of them might be a little bit more generalized, a little bit more regressed. They can do it in their, in their bedroom. What are some examples of how they might do it like on a field? in their sport for me i've always thought about baseball as as the ball is the trainer right and i think if you look at it from that way then you you could basically do any flow at that point is we're using the baseball as the trainer to kind of emerge some movement from them or some potential right or ingrain some pattern by using literally just the baseball of rolling it to them where they have to go get it but it's always in a flow pattern and it's always coming up and doing a throw and for me that that's a great way of doing it like the way you're doing it is but I think it comes from just that theory of the ball is the trainer. At that point, you're not giving any cues. You're not doing anything. You're just allowing them to self-organize into getting that ball, throwing it, performing that task. And I think that's for me where you get a little bit more specific, right? Now, I think at the same point, the ball could be a great trainer and then a bad trainer. Because I feel like a lot of people also think that, oh, let's just go throw them ground balls. Let's just, you know, and I was like, yeah, if they're going to move well, they're, they would just be... Like just throwing somebody ground balls, it's not, it's not the biggest game changer, right? As you have to be intentional with, hey, guess what? We're going to do a floor pattern, a flow pattern where you're going to get down, do this flow, and then come up and throw. And for me, that's where we're building dynamic movers. That's where you're going like, hey, guess what? 
when you go on the mound, now you'll be able to throw it from any angle, any arm slot. You can throw sidearm this and that, still throw strikes, still throw heat. Um, so it's one of those where, where you're going. Now we're, we're creating these options for you that you didn't have before, where before your throws were very robotic, very repeatable, but at the same time, you're going like there's no variability. Like you, you can't be up there like a robot. You got to be very like robust, very dynamic on the mound. So I, I, what I felt is that the coaches that use it that way, where they're using the ball as the trainer, and then also they understand the patterning, uh, that, that's where for me it's you're creating exponential changes on the athlete. So I think it's it's very easy to see kind of the correlation between some of the, the ground-based flows and like an infielder making a diving stop to a, you know, firing to first base or, you know, some of the flows where an outfielder is dynamically coming in, fielding a ground ball, you know, and firing. Uh, what are some of the best flows or maybe like what's one favorite flow that you can maybe describe for people, for pitchers? Because we have a lot of pitchers listening. Um, they're not going to necessarily be starting on the ground, you know, in their sport. So... What are some examples of ways to add that dynamic variability in maybe a, a flow context outside of the field? Man, for me, it's, it's one of those where the way I always see movement is that you have to explore all spectrums of movement, right? Like if you're on the mound and, and you're thinking, okay, all I'm going to do is just explore this one throwing pattern and that's all you're doing, then you're limiting yourself to going like, you should be able to transition all the way from the ground, flow up and make a throw. I go, now, now your, your, your brain, when you go up there and you start throwing, your hinge, you can be able to hinge all the way down, all the way up, in and out of it, just because the spatial awareness and the movements that you've been doing are just so much robust, so much bigger. So I think sometimes athletes will get stuck a lot in the skill, and then they go like, I'll just explore this hinge. I'll just go this low. Where for me, it's always like, you know what? A bear crawl to an S mount into a throw it's one of those where you go like, if you can do that, by the time you get on the mound, trust me, any movement you want to do on the mound is going to seem like a, like a, like a cakewalk. What are your thoughts on, um, on long toss? This is something I've, I've talked to Alan Jager about, and he says in long toss, he's specific. So one of the critiques of long toss is what well, your mechanics change, right? The max effort throw is, is uphill. As you come in, you're, you're more downhill. And, you know, maybe not all of those mechanics look exactly like they're going to look when you're pitching downhill to a catcher, you know, in a game in a game context, the specificity isn't like perfect one to one, and so that's a critique of long toss sometimes. But he was saying, no, wait a second, like we actually want our pitchers to come out of their mechanics in their long toss. We want to see that variability as they're as they're working up to come out of their mechanics, be able to feel all of those different angles of their arm slot, of their trunk positioning, and now they have all this this awareness of like, okay, that's what that slot feels like, that's what that slot feels like, and then as they come down they can tie it all back into their sports specific skill of getting downhill. So his, his whole point was like, we don't actually want to just practice that one specific, very narrow delivery, but we want to have some, some variability within that range so that you can feel, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's exploring in long toss, the high slot, you know, uphill to getting downhill. Maybe it's, we'll do this sometimes with our guys. We'll have them play around in their warm up drills with like, Hey, throw some sidearm, throw some low three quarter, throw some higher slot, so they can feel. Hey, we know they're still going to be three quarter on the mound, but now they have some awareness of what it feels like to go a little too extreme in either direction. What's your thought on that? I know it doesn't fully fit into the flows concept, but does that kind of tie into your approach to to movement and to being athletic on the mound? I think that's perfect example that you know you showed there with Alan. I think he's right on point. Is that you want to explore as many movements as possible, uh, but also you want to build that, that, for them, you want to build that efficiency and that stable patterns outside of their normal pattern, right? Like their preference. You want them to explore. And, and I think for me, it's anything you do where you're, you're using some type of constraint, right? Like running up hills, running down hills, throwing uphill, throwing downhill, throwing sidearm, throwing sideways. I mean, anything you could add, I think it just makes them way better problem solvers once they get on the mound. Right? Where, where when you're fatigued, guess what? Your mechanics are just not going to be the same. I don't care what you're saying. You know, in the first inning and the seventh inning, your mechanics are going to be different. So if you're if you're not figuring out that bandwidth and that 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 stability and those patterns and then that 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 those different movements, then it's one of those where at that point you're running out of options. And at a certain point, we're introducing now like bad variability, right? Or bad patterns, inefficiency, and you're putting in yourself that you're just not very comfortable. 
Uh, and at that point, you're opening up yourself for, for more stress on certain structures. It's one of those concepts that people can, this idea of variability and having a bunch of different movement options, people grasp it really easily in, in more like open skills, like, like basketball, for example. Like people intuitively understand, like you're gonna be making shots from all different places on the court, like off one foot, off two feet, like defender in your face, like you're gonna be like both hands. They understand this idea of like training variability, but then you get to a, a more closed skill, like, uh, you know, a golf swing or something or, or pitching where the perceived variability is lower. Like the argument on the other side is like, this is what you'll hear from a lot of old school coaches as well. It's always 60 feet, six inches away from the rubber to the plate. You always have a catcher there. Like it's, it's much more this like tunnel vision, um, just repeat the exact same delivery over and over and over again with zero variance. Um, why do you think it is that people have a hard time extrapolating this variability concept to a sport like, like pitching? And do you think that that's, do you think that we're making progress towards changing that? I think two things. One, we are at a paradigm shift. I think we're making tons of progress. And I mean, I mean, five years ago, there wasn't anybody having this discussion we're having now, right? No one. No one was discussing this five years ago in the sense of like, hey, guess what? Maybe there's not one ideal movement. You know, there, maybe there's, there, you could flow. Maybe you could build, you could build fluid movements, right? Maybe there's a system where we could build this robust mover. And we're working on the movement system, not just the skill. Like people were just not having this conversation. So I feel like there is a huge paradigm shift. I think another thing is just historically, like baseball has been stuck in mechanics. Just we've been stuck on like, that noon laws and the mechanics and like everything is controllable and, and there's these angles and we can measure this. And it's one of those where we've just been stuck in that reductionist approach for way too long. I would, I would almost not blame the old school guys because the old school guys were a little bit more like just find your balance, find your stability, take your hacks. Like you're going to have your own swing. Trust me in the nineties, that's what I heard. And then there was like this paradigm shift now to where we went into mechanics. We went into joint angles. We went into all these things like in the two thousands, uh, 2010, you know, 2015. And I feel like we are in a paradigm shift now where we're working our way out of that model. Uh, and I'm not saying it's a broken model. I'm just saying that there's way more to explore on, on our end as far as movement. You know, where you go, like, there are limitations. And I'm not saying it's broken because I think we could gain a lot of knowledge too from that, right? I think there's great ways of measuring movements that we didn't have before. So I think from that model, I like it. I like that we can measure so many different things now, but at the same time, it's how you address those measurements and how you go about it that needs to change, right? Is you can't measure something and then think, oh, mechanically, we're going to fix this, right? We're going to go through some kind of joint, joint mobility and we're going to go in and automatically it's going to be like a car, right? Where now it's functioning, everything's great. And you go like, no, that's how we go about getting that measurement. It's way more important. But I like, I like what I hear when I go on Twitter. Obviously, it's probably I follow a little bit more people that think alike like I do. I think at the end of the day, what we're doing is we're just trying to get the player to be better on the field, to be more robust, to be more resilient, right? To be just a better mover, to be more consistent. And when we shoot for those things, I mean, if you're not training your movement system and your movement flow, I think you're leaving a lot of your potential uh, out, on the, out on the table. Yeah, I know, I know one, uh, one thing that makes me initially think of is, is this idea of, at least in, you mentioned mechanics. Um, and obviously like there is, there is some correlation to like the joint positions that guys are getting into and their outcomes and, and all that, but it's a matter of how do you get there, right? It's, it's, you talk about transitions all the time. It's not just hitting a static position. It's about how do you transition and flow in out of that position. So a, a great example would be like hip shoulder separation, right? Like are, are you trying to hit that perfect landing position where your shoulders are closed and your hips are open? Cause like, you can get there a million different ways. Like you can just reach your legs open, reach your hips open, try to force your shoulders close and land there and like pose and smile for the camera. And they have a picture of you and like the picture makes it look like you have, hey, he's got great hip shoulder separation. But that doesn't actually indicate, you didn't get there the right way. You didn't flow through that position with power. You just forced a static position to occur. So I think that's, that's a corollary to what you're talking about that you know we've seen with mechanical training is like we yes we recognize maybe the motion capture or just our understanding of mechanics we see okay this guy's not creating separation okay so that's killing his velo we we do know that that is a variable but how do we address it do we address it by telling him to force himself into static positions 
or do we address it by teaching them how to move dynamically? And so it's a completely different paradigm shift in terms of like the drills you might give him, the cues you might give him when you approach it from that like total body perspective versus just trying to hit a static position. Well, I think when we look at things like that, right, hip shoulder separation, we're always looking at like the expression of a movement, right? Like what happened? What is the outcome, right? It was just, we separated our hips from our shoulder. That was the outcome. But we never look at the intra actions, like the intra actions, like what's happening on the inside that actually, that, that occurred because there was something on the inside that led to that uh, expression of movement. Right. And it's I think a, it's a, if it's we're just looking at- that leads to that. It's not, you can't just look at the end of the throw and, and measure that and try to recreate artificially. It's like all the, like you're saying, all the things that have to happen right ahead of time to be able to create that dynamic position, that dynamic action. Because it's, yes, yes, it's a position if you just take a slice of time, but it's also a dynamic movement. So you can't just look at that one millisecond in time and in space. You have to look at the entire action and how they flowed through that action. Exactly. You, you have to look at the entire flow. It's one of those where I think when we, the more we try to separate and the more we try to just look at positions, the more we put players in positions that might be unnatural to them or that they might not even need, right? Like some people, like, and you've probably seen it where you go like, this guy doesn't get much separation, but why, how's he throw so hard? Right. You just like, they're just different movers. They're, people just, we're all built a little different, you know? And it's one of those where you just can't take the goat model and think that, Hey, guess what? If we just get everybody to separate more that magically everything's going to happen. When in reality, I mean, when you'd separate, you better get back to neutral somehow. I mean, that's the way I see it. You know, it's one of those things that separation is just part of the part of something that we look at. But for me, as if we're not converging and the body's not converging back to neutral at release point, uh, then you're putting yourself in a position where you're going like maybe the separation, you're not able to reconnect. And I think that's another flow that sometimes people avoid, uh, ignore a little bit, right? Where they're just looking at one component of like, we stretched the rubber band and you're going like, well, guess what? That rubber band just stayed stretched. It never came back to full power, to full neutral, you know? And I think for me with the flows, that's been one thing that I've always worked on is if we are gonna separate, then we better be able to get back to neutral, converge back to neutral and make sure that we're closing the gap. And, and I think there's, there's not enough people training that. And sometimes there's a lot of people that are training the opposite direction where they're doing mobility or, or stretches, right? To just separate more. And for me, separation for the sake of separation is kind of pointless, you know? I mean, I think if you get separation based on your system and based on your interactions, how your muscles are working, how your muscles are firing, the kinetic energy you're developing, if you're, if you're getting separation because all that is on point and you're able to naturally get that and, and organically build it, then I think that's great separation. If you're trying to manufacture it by stretching or trying to do some thoracic mobility and you think that's going to magically transfer to the skill, I think you're, you're, you better be performing the flows. That's all I'm saying, man. So how, how do you, obviously the flows, play, you know, part of the intent there is to, to learn, to open up movement options, right? It's, it's giving a, it's athleticism training, right? It's, it's giving them a diverse array of movement options. Now they know how to get up from this angle, from this angle, how to get up here, turn fire, how to balance something here while moving this way. It's giving them a ton of variability in terms of how they can now move in ways that they've maybe weren't familiar with moving. And so now when they get on the mound, you know, their bodies learn how to move from this joint angle and this joint angle and coordinate with this. So that's one piece of it. How do you maybe overload some of these movements? Because I've seen you post things where, you know, it's, you're working kind of like the, the rotational slings, the fascial slings, you've got bands incorporated there to try to add a little bit of resistance. So are you, are you incorporating some of the resistance training or overloading to these movements as well to try to use them to like strengthen these fascial slings, strengthen these movements, or are you just using them as more like coordination type training? I think both. I think you could actually kill. I think when we start to separate co coordination, strength, mobility, I think we're doing a disservice to the player because I think you could attack a lot of those things. Like you could kill, you could kill a lot of those with one movement. You know, you could actually overload a movement. You could actually gain some mobility. You could gain coordination. And you could also gain strength in that pattern. So I think for me is if I was going to work with developmental patterns, I wanted to work with the whole spectrum as far as I want to get, I want your system to gain mobility, but through a system approach, I want you to be coordinated and be able to flow in and out of these positions from a systems approach. I want you to be strong, but I want you to be strong in these patterns, right? I want you, I want to overload these patterns with kettlebells. 
I want to make sure that we're able to flow and as, as, we're, as we're transitioning weight from one spot to another and self-organize your body when it's actually overloaded. Because I, I feel like for me, weight and overloading is a great trainer, but it's also a horrible trainer in some instances, right? If you overload an athlete and they get into these patterns and they're, they're not staying centrated and they're doing, that's when we get injuries in the gym and that's when things happen, right? Where you just overload people and then you go like, those patterns are just not very efficient at a certain point. But I feel like if you find the, the right challenge point and the right load, that, that, that ingrains patterns a lot quicker than if we just did body movements or just body weight. Do you have kind of like, you talk about how the challenge point and, and modifying it depending on the guy. So do you have kind of like pre, pre-planned, um, like do you have ways that they can level up already kind of pre-planned? Like, hey, we're going to do like this initial ground-based thing and then we're going to do ground-based to standing and then we're going to do ground-based to standing to turning and firing. And now we're going to do ground base to standing, to turning and firing with resistance. Like, do you have these different levels and progressions already mapped out for different planes of motion where you kind of know what the end state is? Like, hey, we're trying to get this 12 year old who's not very athletic through this pattern to where a year from now he's able to do this movement in his own organic way, his own, you know, true, you know, weight where he can stay true to his own movement and body. Um, with this amount of load, like how systematized is it or how systemized is, is it from the progression standpoint? Or is it more just about exploring and you want to use the on-field performance as the indicator? No, it's 100%. It's very systematic. The progression is very, it's a year program as far as training and, and they start with body weight. Then eventually we're doing kettlebells. We're doing the aqua bag. We're definitely getting into it, but we're talking about five, six months from now. But with that being said, I do throw a kettlebell in there the first month. You know, I, I want people to, like, we shouldn't have this model of like, hey, guess what? You need to be this strong to be able to do this. You need to be like linear, right? So I did throw a couple of curveballs in there just so the players stay on their toes as far as like, hey, guess what? We are going to do some things with a kettlebell, but we're going to do it in a simple transition. We're going to do some things with the resistance bands, but we're going to do it in more simple transitions. As they get into deeper into the program, then we start to make things a lot way more dynamic. And a lot of the stuff I actually post on Twitter is the higher level stuff. You know, I do post some of the flows with the kettlebell that I go like, you know what? That kid there has been doing it for nine months. So obviously he looks good, but I would not start a kid on day zero or just go online and go like, hey, guess what? Try that. I would definitely take him through the progression where you go like, you got to understand that that kid there, he's been doing it for nine months. So he looks well. That's a good flow for him. That's why I posted it. And it's one of those where I, I always think like social media is so tricky, man. So I feel like 80% of what's posted on social media works for 20% of the people. And it's, and it's one of those where you go like, you know what, find yourself a good program, find yourself, go on the app and, and just sign yourself up and start moving better. Find yourself a program with Tread. You guys have a great program also where you go like, you know what, there's plenty of resources now that, that you can go to. Uh, but I mean, that's a whole different ball game as far as social media. Yeah, if you're going to pick a program, actually, you know, give it a chance and stick to it. There, there's there's a lot of, like, program hoppers out there where they'll try something for a month and then they'll see some new exercise on Instagram and, like, now that's the thing they're doing for that week and then they're just constantly bouncing around and not actually giving anyone, assuming it's a legitimate program with a legitimate progression and there's a rationale, like, give it a try. Like, give it a genuine chance to work versus trying to bounce back and forth. Um, I'm curious, we talked about some of the things they can do in practice that fits along these lines. Um, what about others, other sports? So let's say we're talking about a younger kid who's deciding, hey, do I, do I specialize in, in pitching? I really want to pitch in college. I'm 13 years old. Um, at what point do you encourage them to specialize? Do you think they should still be playing multiple sports or specializing while doing flow type training? Um, and then if so, what are some of the sports that you think would be really good as far as opening up this diverse array of, of movement options, or if we want to call this athleticism, general athleticism training, uh, what are your thoughts on multiple sports? For me, I actually like multiple, multiple sports, you know? I like kids exploring different things. I think what people don't realize though, that I think it doesn't have to be structured though. Does that make sense? I think so many people get so like competitive and they want to join some league and they want everything structured for the kid. And at a certain point you go like, maybe your athlete just needs a break. Right. Like maybe they just need three months of like, hey, let me just go play soccer with my buddies or let me go throw a football with my friends or let me go hit golf balls with my other buddy and let me go play some baseball too, right? Throw some balls around. But it's one of those where I think like 
those explorations should be fun. And I think if, if you're forcing your kid into multiple sports, then that's also, it could be detrimental, right? Because the intention's not there, they're not having fun. So I always feel like you definitely want to encourage multiple sports. But like even for myself, the only thing I ever played was baseball. And I could only speak for myself is that maybe it would have helped me to explore soccer, right? Like footwork. Like one of my buddies told me, he's like, oh, I learned so much great footwork from soccer. But then I was thinking to myself, but you don't have the best footwork on the field. So I don't know, like, I don't know how much helpful that was. It's not like he's a genius as far as his footwork on the field, right? Where I go like, yeah, you still can't catch. Because at a certain point for me, I feel like you do have to be a little OCD about baseball. Not competitive, but just playing, just catching a ball. Like the kid that you see with a glove year round, that kid is legit on the field. The kid that you see with a baseball bat, just year round hitting with his brothers, hitting outside, hitting by themselves, doing whatever it is, right? Not competitive, just exploring the skill and getting and trying it and trying it. I think there's something to be said about that. So I don't know. I think that's where there's definitely a Goldilocks zone where you want to explore other sports. But at the same time, there's also a Goldilocks zone of where you want to ingrain the skill. And, and I think for me, I was one of those kids that I was just OCD about baseball. I would play baseball all the time. I would go on the railroad tracks and hit rocks all day. I would go and play with my brothers, hit cans all day. I would do it in the summer. I would do it in the winter. I would do it when it was raining. I would just work the skill all day, but never competitive. I think I probably played, I did Little League. So what's that, like 12 games a year maybe? Yeah, I definitely I definitely agree with that that take in terms of you don't want to get stuck in, in one sport with such robotic move, especially if you only play one sport and you're being overly coached to where everything's just robotic and you're being very confined to not exploring different different movement options and movement patterns. Um, but you also have guys who they play like four sports a year and they're doing everything like super seriously and traveling all the time. And they say they want to focus and play college baseball, but now they got basketball season for four months and you know over the summer they're doing you know, something else and they got football in the fall and like they never actually have time to really focus on their skill. So there, there kind of is like a sweet spot, I think, where there probably are some 16, 17 year olds who would have a better chance of playing college baseball if they truly do want that to be their goal, if they did focus while still being careful to not lose that athleticism and still, like you said, exploring other movements, uh, maybe a more informal capacity than like a really structured, uh, structured type thing. I'm curious your take on this. So this is one of my theories. Like I don't have kids, but maybe one day when I do, uh, this will be a recommendation. Uh, karate slash martial arts and parkour. To me, those seem like two of the most exploratory sports or whatever you want to call them out there. Because just in their, in their nature, it's body control, it's proprioception, it's, it's, it's awareness, it's harnessing rotation, it's in interacting with your environment. Like, not that there isn't benefit to things like soccer, um, but it just seems like the dynamic nature of those sports, parkour and any sort of martial arts. It's like, how much, like if you were designing a sport that was purely to develop athleticism, like my theory is like, that's gotta be one of the best ones. And I've talked to, I've talked to a number of undersized, like upper nineties throwers who just, ha just so happened to be black belts because they, they were obsessed with martial arts when they were kids. Like, wh what are your thoughts on that? Is, am I completely off base on, on that? theory do you think it matters which sports as long as they're playing a bunch of different sports i, I think jujitsu is probably one that that comes to mind for me because when, when i watch the mma guys and i watch the flow and i watch a lot of the training they do in brazil you go like i think those are some of the best movers in the world is the jujitsu guys right because they're able to get in transitions and and kind of with another person on you i mean i don't know if you've ever tried to move a human being but every time you're wrestling somebody it just seems like you find a way to power through, you build like functional strength. I mean, you're building so many different things as far as jujitsu and, and MMA, that type of training. Also martial arts is a great one. Like you mentioned is there's other things that we do. And then parkour, I mean, that other day I went to a parkour park and, and I was talking to the guy about movement flow and I'd actually learned a lot from him, right? Because they look at movement just a little bit different. You know, they, 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 they have a different way of looking at it. Which for me, I was like, you know what, that is pretty. So I, I tried to sign up my kid, but I don't know if you've ever, and you don't have kids. So when you have a six, four year old, uh, sometimes half the battle is just keeping them alive, to be honest with you. Right. It's, it's one of, one of, yeah, where you go, like, they're a little too young to be in, in a structured environment like that, or, or kind of like. So what I do is I usually do flows at my home, 
Or I take them to the park and go like, hey, guess what? Go climb on this, go jump on that. Uh, but yeah, I think those sports for me build it great. I think there's other sports for the way we train that, that you go like probably don't build as robust movers, obviously, right? Where you go, uh, you know what? I don't know how much of that you're going to build on the football field as right. far as exploration, as far as getting in and out of places. Uh, but I do see football changing because it's crazy. I mean, ever since I came out with the flows, I've had basketball coaches reach out to me. I've had football coaches reach out to me. I've had cricket reach out. I've had pickleball, which is crazy, you know, but all those coaches have reached out to me going like, hey, guess what? I want to do the flows for this specific sport. Uh, and for me, that's the cool thing, right, is, is I went into it trying to help people how to move better. So I, I named it Baseball Flows because I love baseball. I played baseball. I'm obsessed with the sport. But at the same time, for me, I do movement. And I go, you know what? If you want to create a good mover, then our program, I think, gets it right on, right on the nose. I'm really interested in this idea of flow state, not to be confused with the flows, but the flow state being in the zone. And I'm interested in this idea of, like, the role of fun in training. Because there's, there's some link there. There's some link with um, exploring, being present, you know, being engaged and like having fun, but also, you know, the dopamine hit of like trying to figure something out versus being prescribed something. So like my, my more, more recent example to this was like teaching myself uh, how to do like walking handstands, right? It, you know, it starts where it's like, it's not, hey, go do like three sets of 10 second, whatever holds. And it's just like, okay, this is boring, but I'll do it because it'll get me better. This is like acquiring a new skill there's something engaging about that. There's something fun. There's something you get in the flow state. You're like, I want to just practice this all day. Like I'm not even in the weight room and I'm still like trying to do handstands and like I'll hold it for three seconds that time. And then I'll hold it for 10 seconds. And now I'm a few weeks later, I'm like walking 60 feet on my hands. And it's like, it's something that it's a way different experience to go through that, that like that organic learning process than to just say like, go do, a downward dog hold for three sets of 30 seconds to train the scapular upward rotators and low traps, right? You're you're training the same muscles, but one is like this engaging immersive experience to learn a skill where you're in the flow, you're having fun. And one is like, you're just training the muscles for the sake of training the muscles. Like uh, skateboarders are there. They're not like you just go out as a kid, you explore, you have fun. You'd like learn a bunch of moves and suddenly you have like a Sean white. Yeah. Like your experience playing baseball is just like, go, go have fun, go explore. How do you think like the fun fits into this, the flow state and this approach to learning a skill or, or training movement versus the very prescriptive version of training movement? Well, I think there's words that go together cleanly, right? Where you just go like, these things are just synonymous with fun. One thing is, I think when you're having fun, you're present. When you're present, you're aware, right? When you're also having fun is when you're in discovery mode. So I feel like discovery mode, it's always fun for everybody. Because guess what? Like your brain is like, I think just intrinsically we're built to discover. Like we're not built to be static and just go like, hey, guess what? I'm basically from now on, it's downhill. You go now nah, from now on, it's me trying to discover new things about myself, trying to discover different movements. Uh, like it's I always compare like when you go on a new hike, right? And you're going like, hey, let's go on a new hike. Like who cares where we go? Let's just get out there and start to discover the world and let's get be one with nature, right? Those things are like when you're the most present, most aware, having the most fun. And those, those memories for me, just if you think about psychologically, those are the ones that stick in your head the most, don't they? Where you go like, I remember when we went to Italy and we had fun and we had, went to discover this place in Rome and we did, did all that stuff, right? It's the same thing with movement. I think that when you're having fun, when you're discovering, when you're on the baseball field, those are the things where now we're talking about motor learning, right? You're talking about those are the things that will be ingrained in your movement system. Is the things that you do when you're having fun and you're discovering. It's not the static, boring stuff where you're just kind of going through the motions. Those things, that's just, for me, I always see that as motor performance. Like, that's fleeting, right? You're, you're not building much there. It's when we're having fun, when we're discovering, those are the things that get ingrained in us. And for me, the flow stuff was always like that. I tell parents all the time, like, make it fun for your kids. Have them discover. This is not like, you need to do this. You know, if they want to do it twice a week, do it twice a week. They want to do it three times a week. But the prerequisite is intention, awareness, fun, discovery, exploration. It's one of those where I think there's definitely something about fun that goes with discovery that also goes with the flow state, right? Where you're going like, I'm not really thinking about anything. I always like, men always like to think about things like opposite, right? 
Like you go, oh, what's fun have to do with that? Well, think about the opposite of fun. When's the last time you felt in the flow state and you just weren't having fun? When's the last time you were in a bad mood and you were in the flow state? I was like, it just doesn't happen, right? You go like, guess what? There is something there where discovery is fun, exploration is fun. And that learning is, is, is for me, what actually sticks in when you're actually on the field. Yeah, there's, some, there's something to be said for, from the fun standpoint, being an indicator of learning taking place or you being at the right challenge point for learning to take place. Because if, if it's way too advanced, it's, it's going to be overly frustrating because you're just failing every rep. But if it's too, too beginner for you, like it's too easy, you're not really having fun because like I could do this in my sleep. So part of it is like finding the right progression to your point so that they can explore within that. So that almost like it's your brain's natural feedback of like, okay, this is, I'm in the right place at the right time, at the right challenge point, at the right level, like I'm engaged. Right? I, think, I think part of it's that. But I do think there's, at least speaking from my own experience, like maybe there, there's something to be said for having fun, but there's also something to be said for, there are times when achieving at a very high level is not going to be fun. Like if you get injured, like you got to do the rehab and the rehab's not all going to be fun. You, you know, you're going to have to show up, you know, if you go play in college, you're gonna have to show up for early morning lifts and that might not be fun. Like the capacity to push through the discomfort and the times that aren't fun is still very valid. But I've, I'm increasingly seeing the, the validity of like, well, if you want as much of it to be fun as possible, knowing like a good portion of this preparation is like, at least at a higher level, it's going to feel like a job. Can we make as much of it as possible engaging fun and in that learner's mentality? Can we make the warm up fun? Can we make, you know, our pre throwing stuff our catch play? Like, can we get it to a point where they're fully immersed and engaged in as much of it as possible? knowing that that's going to increase compliance, that's going to increase their general motivation to, to stick it out. Yeah, I think there's definitely a spectrum, right? Where you, you want to have fun and then there's times to get your nose down in the dirt and start getting to work. But I think they're not exclusive. I think you can actually do both, right? I think you could have fun while you're getting your work done. I, I think sometimes we have this thing where we put um, certain things like, oh, those are boring exercises. And you go like, well, yeah, maybe they're boring because they're not doing much for you, right? We think maybe, maybe that's the reason, you know, maybe your, your brain intuitively knows that I'm not getting much out of this, right? So for me, it's always been like, hey, guess what? Movement exploration. At the same time, if you do have a rehab and you have to do things like, obviously, if your elbow's not getting straight, you're, you're, it's not going to be fun to get your elbow straight after rehab. It's just, there's no way around it, right? There's no way... Like, I can't play a song, I can't do a dance, nothing. It just sucks to get your elbow from not getting straight to getting all the way straight. But at the same time, can you make it where now we're actually going like, hey, guess what? We are going to do other things that are fun. We are going to do these flows. We are going to explore movements. Like, it doesn't just have to be come in here, be tortured from PT, and then go home. It's, hey, guess what? There's a whole movement system. There's a whole person behind this elbow. There's a whole thing that we could discuss. And, and I think for me, it's that's way more buy-in that you're going to get from a from a player when you start discussing those things then guess what i'm just here to get your elbow straight i think it's, it's not going to be fun yeah i think it's worth pointing out for people too like you've come up with like some flows but it doesn't mean that like you've come up with the only flows that anyone could ever come up with right like encourage if coaches are watching this like having some of the freedom as well to like take some of these concepts himself like if you have a player and you're trying to get them all right, let's say elbow extension example like you could give somebody just like hold the dumbbell straight overhead and like strengthen your tricep work on elbow you know elbow stability in that position or you can have them do bear crawls like you're, you're working the same physical attributes in both but one is this like dynamic variable version of that whereas one is the static linear prescribed version of that so just like allowing the coaches that are hearing this to think through like, Hey, how can I make some of the stuff I'm already doing with my guys just a little bit more variable, a little bit more dynamic, a little bit more alive and still getting the same effect, the same warm up effects, the same tissue adaptation effects, the same strengthening effects and whatever they're already, that they're already going for in those movements, but just adding that extra layer on top of what they're already doing. So I, I think some of the things you've come up with are great. But point, point being, it's like the tip of the iceberg. There's so many other options that people can continue to explore. There's no like one right way to do a flow. No, I don't think so. I think there's definitely a bandwidth and there's certain patterns that are probably more prevalent 
as far as how you want to move and how you want to organize your body. And if you want to know the patterns, I usually tell people, like, just watch a kid move, right? That's probably the most natural patterns you're going to see. But at the same time, like you mentioned, if you're a coach, I always tell people, like, learn principles. Learn principles. Once you learn principles and you, and you have a good theory and you have a good philosophy, then you're able to explore within those principles, right? Where you go, hey, guess what? I'm like One of the principles could be, like, I'm going to be systems-based. I'm going to look at the system more than just one joint. And like you mentioned there, with that one exercise, you go, okay, is that am I working a system or am I working a joint? And if your answer is I'm working an isolated joint, you might want to think, can I attack this? How do I make this where now I'm training the system? Where I'm actually killing more than one bird with, with a stone, right? Where you go like, hey, guess what? Maybe we could start progressing you where now we're getting you into positions and transitions that you're going to use on the baseball field as we get your elbow straight. Right, we're starting to kind of build that connection, interconnectedness of your body and your nervous system. Because uh, I've, I've made the mistake myself, right? I've had players just sit there and do exercises that that now I look at and I was like, why? Why did I ever just? Because we all don't have a, like, if we had enough time to do it any which way, then that would be great. But at a certain point, we only have so much time to be intentional, to be aware, to be to be having fun, to be discovering. So for me, it's always about like, we need to be efficient with how we train our players. And if you could think systems and go like, that's my principle, that's my philosophy, then you're going to get a lot more out of A, the players, and then the training sessions that you do. How do you see something like like strength training fitting in? Like, I'm assuming a lot of your guys are maybe not the younger kids, but one of the one of the challenges that I would see with, with the flow, like, obviously this isn't, isn't the only thing they're doing, but the flows are a lot more subjective, right? It's, it's with a squat, you can be like, okay, I'm gonna do 200 pounds this week and 205 pounds the next week and 210 pounds the next week. Like it's, it's, you can progress it and measure it really precisely, which if you're trying to grow your quads or you know, put on 20 pounds, like there is a benefit to being, things being very measurable. So are you, do you have any thoughts on like these guys still doing their traditional strength training and then adding the flow stuff on top of it? Or are you starting to try to incorporate the flow stuff into the weight room as well? No, I think for me, the weight room is, is I have a lot of respect for strength and conditioning guys. On my end, I always feel like they put in the due diligence to learn how to, how to get the adaptations that they need. And for me, I've always felt like, find yourself a good strength and conditioning coach. You know, because I've had some great discussion with coaches that I go like, you know what? You're right, strength is not my thing, right? I'm not gonna build this capacity to uh, upload or, or like this power output, right? Where you're going like, hey, we're just gonna overload you. We're gonna measure it. We're gonna load you up and we're gonna get you to, to do these movements. I think for me, it's just been the combination of strength and the flows where I go like, that's probably one of the best combinations I've seen. Where I go like, go in the weight room, throw some weight around. Also realize that like for me, anything is kind of like an inverted U. So you're going to see these gains instantly coming up and going like, oh, guess what? I'm getting stronger. I'm getting stronger. My performance is getting better. I'm throwing harder. I'm getting stronger. I'm throwing harder. But then there's going to be the point where you get into diminishing returns where you're going like, hey, hold on. I'm getting stronger, but I'm throwing slower or I'm getting stronger and my velocity is just tapped out, but I'm getting stronger. And you go, okay, guess what? Maybe it's time to A, not overload on that movement. Maybe search for another movement in the weight room. Or maybe it's time to get on the baseball flows and start moving better and really start going like, hey, can I do a combination? Because I'm, I'm not the type of person who's like, oh, you don't have to be in the weight room. I understand. I understand that we have to build the capacity to throw around weight and to build those muscles, right? But I also understand that like, it cannot be at a detriment to your movement system. And that's kind of what I see a lot, right? I see kids that go in the weight room and then they come out and they just move like crap. And I go like, come on, man. Like, do some flows, get in there and, and like, make sure that you're not losing, that your movement system is still pretty sharp. And I think if we're not exploring the flows, then it's one of those where you go like, I don't know, I don't know if you're becoming better at the skill. Cause I still feel like there's a gap. I mean, if you just look at how people like go to the gym and look at how they move in the gym and then look at how they move in the baseball field. And you're going like, it's just not the same movements. Like I just don't see it. Right. And it's okay. It doesn't mean that it has to be perfect. I just say like, Hey, guess what? I developed a program to bridge that gap from the weight room, how you move in the weight room to how you move on the field. I've developed that program. And surprisingly enough, every strength guy I talk to has seen it. And they actually, that those are the ones that buy in the most where they, uh, obviously you get some old school guys that are still kind of fighting it and going like, 
oh, the weight room is everything, you know. But at the same time, I'm 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 never that person who says movement is everything, right? You go like, hey, guess what? The weight room has has its its priorities, right? You're going to build certain things in the weight room that you're not going to build with the flows. But my suggestion would be that if you're going to do the weight room, if you're going to do explosive movements, just to make sure that we're building the movement system and keeping the quality, I would go like, I would suggest that you do both. For sure. And, and you mentioned like it's important to find a good strength coach because again, what you're loading in the movement, what you're loading in the weight room is reinforcing those movements. So if you have guys like doing really crappy partial range of motion squats with a rounded back, that's the movement you're reinforcing as you load it. As you load more and more weight on that bad movement, you're just reinforcing bad movement. As you load like half rep ch chin ups with more and more weight, like you're reinforcing that, that movement. But good, I mean, good strength coaches understand, the good strength coaches will start to get guys into multiple planes. They'll start to add some of these, you know, uh, fascial sling type movements, rotational movements. Um, and I do see like a little bit of overlap with what some of the better strength coaches are doing in some of the rotational movements and what, what you're doing in some of your flow stuff. So I think that's great advice is like finding, finding a strength coach who understands and is, is interested in maintaining movement quality. Because the worse the strength program they're on, even if they do the flows, it's, just, it's like fighting an uphill battle. But if they're really maintaining movement quality in the weight room and then they add on top of, on top of that additional you know, work for their athleticism, then I think that's, that's a great kind of blend of both worlds. Yeah, exactly. I think you hit the nail on the head because like, for example, I'll see kids doing um, like med ball toss, right? And they're going in there and they're like, oh, great job. They threw the med ball 95 miles or whatever it is, right? And then you go like, yeah, but the movement sucked. Their front side flew open, their, their front hips flying open. And then you go like, I don't know how much of that. You just killed the movement flow and you killed the movement quality. And you just kind of stacked whatever it is on top of it where a good strength guy would notice that right they would go like hey guess what maybe the weight's too heavy weight's a good trainer and it's a bad trainer right maybe we need to go a little bit lighter on the med ball toss still go after the explosiveness still build that but at the same time realizing like hey guess what their front side is flying open like crazy and i don't know if that's a movement you're going to want when you're pitching i don't think that's a movement you want when you're hitting so it's one of those where you go like hey guess what i don't know how much better you're getting on the field based on you trying to build or trying to get up to 95 miles an hour with a med ball toss. Yeah, we, we have to kind of reorient guys from that standpoint as in terms of like we're loading movements, not not muscles. I mean, you are loading muscles too, but the priority is loading a proper movement. You know, what loading a squatting pattern, loading a hinging pattern, loading a unilateral hinging pattern, loading a lateral lunging pattern, you know, loading a unilateral pressing pattern, loading a unilateral horizontal rowing pattern. Like we're, we're loading these patterns and making sure those patterns are just like money patterns where you're, you're moving with good form and loading that versus thinking of it like I have to load my quads and like you can get big quads squatting wrong you can get big lats doing everything completely wrong just following like a high school football coach's lifting program like you can get strong you can get strong muscles but move terribly doing so so I think that's just it's there's so much overlap in terms of that standpoint and what you're talking about for people to hopefully take away um I'd be curious just to end on, end on this question. If you could kind of go back in time, give yourself advice, like give, your, give the 15 year old you some advice, what would that advice be? What would you do to kind of get him on track to hopefully have a longer career, more successful baseball career? I think my biggest thing is a 15 year old me would be, guess what? Life is, is a, play the long game, right? Play the long game in life. You know, put in some work today, but realize that like, hey, guess what? At 15, your life is not set. You know, there's there's plenty of opportunities you're going to get moving forward. Because I just remember when I was 15, 16, I always just thought, like, I guess that's it for me, right? I guess that's done. You know, especially when I dropped out of high school at 17, I felt like I guess life's over because, like, that's it. There's no more opportunities for me, no more options. Now at 46, I look back and I was like, oh, wow, freaking how crazy is that? So many opportunities came after that, right? The Dodgers drafted me. I got into a doctorate program. I started baseball flows. I'm a freaking physical therapist, right? I go, I got three children. I got so many different things from that where I think I would, I would tell that kid to like, hey, guess what? Your life is not over in high school. You're literally just getting started. And no matter where you're at, just believe in yourself and just keep pushing, right? Keep pushing that rock. And I, th I think that would be the, the thing for me that I would say. I don't think I would listen, by the way. I think I would be yeah. like, yeah, whatever. Gotta learn the hard way. <laughs> 
Oh yeah, exactly. Some people just, I think I was just hard headed, but no one ever told me that though. So I don't know. Right. I don't know that. I, I've never heard anybody in my neighborhood tell me that to say, play the long game, right? There, there's going to be plenty of opportunities. Believe in yourself. All these things that you hear, like as a parent that you should do, no one ever told me that. And, and it's one of those where I go like, that's probably what I would say is play the long game, put in the work. You, whatever you do today is just going to accumulate as you move forward. And before you know it, you have something great. Awesome. I think we'll end on that. That was great advice. And Dr. Gallo, appreciate you coming on, sharing your thoughts. Um, hopefully people got some value out of this. Uh, where can they find you if they want to learn more, if they want to learn more about the Flows app or the Flows uh, program? Usually uh, everything goes through our website. So www.baseballflows.com. I think we have everything on there. You can learn the science behind it. You can watch videos that I post. We also have a link to my Twitter, I think, on there and, and IG. So you'll find us also on IG at Baseball Flows Official and then uh, Flows Doc on Twitter and then uh, Doc Baseball Flow on Twitter also. Uh, Baseball Flows was taken on Twitter. Ah. No matter how hard I try, I can't get that account. So uh, it's one of those where I'll take it. Um, but yeah, our website is probably the easiest way they could sign up through the website, get on the app. And then uh, I look forward to meeting a lot of your, uh, a, lot of, a lot of different people. Awesome. We appreciate it.